This video explains how to use critical path analysis. So critical path analysis is a way of planning projects using network diagrams to map out the tasks that need to be done and in what order. And in these network diagrams, we use certain symbols. So this circle is a node and that shows the beginning or end point of an activity. And in the top right of the node, we put the EST, which stands for the earliest start time. And that's the earliest time an activity can begin because of activities which must have been finished before it can start. In the bottom right of the node, we put the, the LFT, which stands for the latest finish time. And that's the latest time an activity should be completed if we're going to keep the whole project on schedule. And the actual activities or the tasks to be completed in the project are shown by an arrow with the duration needed to complete that activity written next to it. The easiest way to explain how these diagrams are put together is with an example. And here we have a list of activities to be completed. Now for a business, this might read ordering supplies or constructing scaffolding, uh, but we're gonna draw up a network diagram for a simpler set of tasks based on cooking a breakfast. So we have the tasks to be completed on the left, the duration of each task in the middle, and the prerequisite on the right. And so that means the tasks which must be completed prior to starting each one. And based on this information, we could put together a network diagram, which looks a bit like this. And so we start with a node, which is labeled as number one. And there are no prerequisites for preparing the ingredients and doing the toast. So we can have these two activities simultaneously coming out of the node here. But the sausages the bacon and the beans, so that's activities C, D and E, all have the preparation of the ingredients as a prerequisite. So we put our second node here and we have activities C, D and E coming out of that node at the same time. And we can only fry the eggs once we've cooked the beans. So we have this third node here with activity E, cooking the beans, going into it, and activity F, making the eggs coming out of it. And then we have node four here because we have to have completed the eggs, the bacon, the sausages, and the toast before we can serve up the ingredients. So we have our fourth node uh, with activity G, which is the service coming out of that. Um, and then finally, we finish with the fifth node to show the end of the project. Now, once we've drawn up the network, we need to fill out the earliest start times and latest finish times. And we do the earliest start times basically by adding up the longest activity durations. So we start here with node one, and we're gonna start with an earliest start time of zero. And we add to that the preparation of the ingredients, which takes five minutes to get an earliest start time for node two of five minutes. So that's the earliest time we can start cooking the sausages, cooking the bacon and doing the beans up here, activities C, D and E. Moving on to node three, the earliest start time is going to be the duration to cook the beans, which is 10 minutes, added to the earliest time we could start it, which was after five minutes. And so that gives us an earliest start time of 15 minutes before we can start frying the eggs. Now node four is going to be a little bit more tricky because we have four activities here feeding into it. So we need to work out which of those takes the longest. So we have activity F, frying the eggs takes five minutes and we could start that after 15 minutes. So that adds up to 20 minutes. We've got activity D, cooking the bacon, which takes 15 minutes and we could start that after five minutes. So that takes us up to 20 minutes as well. We've got activity C, which was making the sausages, 
that takes 25 minutes and we could start it after five minutes so that takes us to 30 minutes so that is the longest so far activity b down here is making the toast that only takes two minutes and so that is nowhere close so we can fill out the earliest start time for node four is going to be 30 minutes and then finally we just add the three minutes for activity g which is serving all of the ingredients together um, to get our final top right box here which is 33 minutes and so that means that we are able to complete this project of cooking our breakfast within 33 minutes and if it's possible to complete the project within 33 minutes we want to make sure that we do so because time is money in business so the latest finish time in the bottom right box of the final node will always be the same as the top right box and then we work backwards taking away the activity durations in order to work out the latest finish times throughout the network so we take away the three minutes to serve up for activity g and we get a latest finish time of 30 minutes here going back to node three we take the five minutes it takes to fry the eggs away from the 30 minutes to get 25 minutes is the latest finish time and what we're saying with that is that the latest time that we can finish activity E and still remain on schedule to complete the project within our 33 minutes is 25 minutes. Working back to node two, we always take the longest path. So we take the activity C, cooking the sausages, the 25 minutes away from the 30 minutes to get a latest finish time for activity A of five minutes and then take the five minutes away from that um, to get zero and we will always have zero zero at the start of our network now once we've drawn up our network we just need to label on the critical path so that is the activities that we can't afford to delay while still remaining on schedule and so you see preparing the ingredients activity a and the latest finish time we have for that is five minutes it takes us five minutes to complete so we can't afford to delay that so that will be on the critical path so we label that with a double dash like that if we go up here to the cooking the beans and frying the eggs e and f between them take 15 minutes added to the five minutes that would take us to 20 minutes so we have a little bit of wriggle room on those activities we have a bit of time to spare on activity d as well that would take us to 20 minutes but activity c doing those sausages that is an activity on the critical path we cannot afford to delay that even by a minute otherwise it would take us beyond 30 minutes so we label that with a dash like this as well activity b clearly we've got loads of time to spare and we can afford to delay that and then finally activity g obviously is on the critical path as well because that takes three minutes to do we can't start it until 30 minutes and even a slight delay to that would take us beyond the 33 minutes that we want to complete within so we label that as on the critical path as well proper term for looking at this amount of kind of wriggle room that we have on each of the different activities is the float time so that is the amount of leeway that we have on an activity how much can it be delayed without putting the whole project back and we can calculate the total float for each activity by taking the latest finish time of that activity taking away the duration how long it takes for that activity and then further taking away the earliest start time of that activity and so to see an example of that we can work out the total float for activity f that was frying the eggs by taking the latest finish time of 30 minutes taking away the activity duration of five minutes to get 25 minutes and then taking away the earliest start time of 15 minutes to give us a total float of that activity of 10 minutes another way of looking at that is that if we can start activity f after 15 minutes and it takes us five minutes to complete well that would take us to 20 minutes in the project and we've still got 10 minutes to play with before we get to our 30 minutes that we have to start activity g by in order to remain on schedule take another example making the toast only takes two minutes 
So the latest finish time for that is 30 minutes. We take away the activity duration of two minutes and then further take away the earliest start time here of zero. And so that would give us a total float for activity B of 28 minutes. As well as being able to draw the network diagrams, it's good to also be able to evaluate the usefulness of critical path analysis. And so the whole point of doing these diagrams is so that we can prioritize the activities that are on the critical path. And this helps us when we're completing complex projects to ensure that everything remains on schedule. And so if there's an activity with a significant float time, might be activity B in our diagram, it doesn't really matter if it goes off schedule. We can relax about that. But activities A, D and E, we need to ensure that resources are diverted towards these activities and make sure that they don't fall off schedule. On the disadvantages, as with any predictive tool, it relies on the accuracy of the estimates for the timings. So if they turn out to be incorrect, it becomes fairly useless. And even if they were pretty watertight estimates at the start, there's always unexpected events in a project which can throw things off course. And a good discussion point to finish with is that the effectiveness of critical path analysis depends on the skills and experience of those preparing the network.